Hello, I'm David Greenberg, and welcome to Ryersonian TV. We're proud to bring to you a debate today between the RSU and the Canadian Federation of Students. In case you're not up to date on the latest developments, here's a summary of what you need to know. The CFS is a national organization representing more than 80 post-secondary student unions across Canada. Earlier this month, the RSU released a report evaluating its relationship with the CFS. The report was highly critical, listing several concerns to do with transparency, governance, and efficiency. The CFS responded by saying that it was a skewed document. On Monday, the RSU also released a joint letter with nine other student unions voicing concerns and stating the student movement could be done better. So joining me to address this is the Chairman of the Canadian Federation of Students, Ray Jean Hoylet. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. And the RSU VP of Education, Victoria Morton. Thanks for joining us as well. Thank you. So welcome to you both. Victoria, I'm going to start with you off the top. Um, you were a member of the reporting committee, and the report was highly critical of the value of the CFS and the value that it brings to the RSU. Do you see value in RSU membership in the CFS? So I want to start by clarifying that the question here isn't necessarily, is there any value provided by the CFS whatsoever? The question is, is there enough value for what we put in? And can that value be bettered elsewhere? Um, and to the answer of that, if you read the report, I think you'll find it's irrefutably, yes, there is better value to be found. Um, students pay $500,000 a year, and we're finding that the services are very outdated or duplicated by um, free services already offered to the public. Um, and the advocacy, there, there's reasonable questions we had about whether or not they, it's been effective over the past 30 years. So it's certainly, um, we're very well within our place to be uh, questioning that at this time. Okay. And Rajan, I'm going to ask you to respond to that. Mm. Um, I think that when the when we heard about the report and when we saw the meeting uh, when we saw the motion pass uh, through the general meeting uh, that talked about uh, evaluating the services of the federation the campaigns of the federation we were really excited uh, for an opportunity to be able to uh, really engage in a conversation about the value of uh, the Canadian Federation of Students, the value of the work that we do, uh, and uh, the work that we can be doing better to to better represent our members. And I think that uh, the report proved to be not an opportunity to have that discussion or not an opportunity to be able to critically look at the work that the Federation uh, is doing. There was uh, a lot of really gross inconsistencies in the report, a lot of uh, inaccurate information that uh, seemed to uh, back a premise um, of, well, the Federation is not doing the work that it's meant to be doing or that it's not representing the students here at Ryerson. And, uh, therefore, there is uh, a need to be able to distance ourselves from the Federation. So I think we were hoping that the, the, the report served uh, an opportunity to be able to actually have a conversation about the work that we were doing in, in some areas to be able to strengthen uh, the work of the Federation. But I, I don't think that this report was that opportunity. So let me ask you this. The CFS's mandate is to fight the increase of tuition fees. Um, but earlier this month, it was announced that Ontario fees rose by 3%. Why, why should the RSU stay in the CFS? Yeah, students have proven to be like remarkably effective when working together. Um, in this past year, we've won things like the Ontario Student Grant. We've uh, pushed this government to uh, revisit how they're looking at student financial assistance because of campaigns that were run here on this campus as well as across the province and across the country. Uh, we've pushed the uh, win government that has um, went from talking about uh, defending tuition fee increases and talking about student financial assistance to thinking that they need to use the language of free education. And that's because of the work that students have been doing. That's because of the work that students united across the province and across the country have been doing. Okay, I'm going to ask Victoria to respond to that. You know, what, what can they be doing to, to do a better job, at least from the RSU's standpoint? To start, I would reply by saying that um, to, to credit the CFS exclusively or considerably for the 30% off uh, or the, the new tuition framework announcement um, that Kathleen Wynn announced, is, is, is pretty inaccurate. I mean, there are other organizations that submitted policy proposals and you can literally take paragraphs out of their proposal and see it in the government, um, the government presentation. And that's like irrefutable evidence that that, um, that particular tactic has been working. Whereas um, it's very concerning that the government, the, the CFS has essentially not changed the messaging or the tactics in 30 years. And, and through that we've seen um, not only st students ignoring it, but the government. Okay, and I'm glad you mentioned um students not knowing or, or uh, you know, the importance of complex discussions. So I'm going to ask you, the RSU pays CFS about half a million dollars annually uh, for membership fees, which translates roughly to about, what, $17 a student. So it was also made clear in the report, in the, in the RSU report, that many students don't even know what the CFS is. So who's to blame for this? For sure. Um, so I want to start by saying that students not knowing about the CFS isn't a new issue, and it's certainly not a Ryerson-exclusive issue. Um, 
similar to what I just said about um, students being numb to the messaging, uh, it's, a, it's the same narrative, it's the same catchphrases, it's the same tactics with very little to show for it. And so for that reason, I think um, that's where students are just, they're numb to it and by the same extension, so is the government. Um, what's more than that is that I think students would always remember something that provided value to them. If, if an organization or a service or a, a, a product or whatever, whatever it is helps you, you remember it. Um, but there's very little proof um, that the advocacy has been successful, the services very few people use or, or could be using better services. Um, and for that reason, why would people remember it? Um, All right, I'm going I'm to ask Rajon to jump in on this one. Yeah. Um, do you agree with what Victoria just said? Yeah. I think that, well, first, it's really important to look at all of the, the work and the victories that students have been able to uh, pull in, in the last year, in the last couple of years. I think that to say that uh, we haven't seen tangible victories or tangible things that are impacting the way that students are living is like a gross misrepresentation of the work that's actually happening. In this past year alone, we've seen the government uh, commit to uh, Bill 132 that ensures that all of our institutions have some form of standalone sexual assault policy, have some form uh, of reporting mechanisms for survivors of sexual violence, are doing proactive consent education work on their campus. That is literally a piece of legislation that will make our campuses safer spaces. It'll um, but, work do, but do students know that that's happening? I think that you'll see that uh, a lot of that work has really paid off and that a, a lot of people have heard about the Federation, they've had an opportunity to talk to people uh, that are working with the organization. There's definitely rooms for us to improve and room for us to grow and we hope that that we could right. also get the students' union support on that. I just want uh, Victoria to respond, you know, do students, are students responding, do you think? I would, I would disagree that uh, many students know what the CFS is and if they do know, it's usually at campuses that there's been a bit of a, a negative experience in, in terms of maybe possible previous litigation and things like that, but most campuses, I don't think students know. Okay, uh, Rajan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna direct this next question to you. The RSU report uh, that, the, excuse me, the report that the RSU um, released a few weeks ago uh, brings up issues about uh, transparency, transparency within the CFS, uh, such as, for example, the refusal to provide audited budgets, uh, not publishing meeting minutes, and refusing to immediately um, release public information. Um, we just want to know, what do, what do you have to say about these allegations? Um, I think that our organization and the student movement has uh, actually a lot of opportunities for, for members to directly engage in decision making, to directly see the work that we're doing, uh, whether that's through general meetings or other venues, but things about like the audited financial statements not being posted online, they're all online. Um, folks can go there and, and take a look at it. Uh, there was this issue of meeting minutes not being posted online. Those are also now online. Um, and so we're but were, they, were they online before or is this in response to what this is in response to like people talking about wanting to see meeting minutes so like that's not a, a difficult thing to be able to make sure that we're rectifying well I, I actually want Victoria to respond to this uh, do you think that the CFS has been transparent in its in well first of all I'm, I'm a bit confused because where are the meeting minutes like when, when I was researching for the report I, I couldn't find them unless they were on like a third-party website yeah so the meeting minutes are all completely like online, there was this letter and uh, among uh, the things that students unions or, or people um, that have an issue of transparency in the organization have been talking about is meeting minutes. So um, within our office, our team was really re uh, responsive in making sure that that information is available. So if you go on the website literally right now, like all of that information is available under uh, the about section of the, the Federation. Okay, yeah. well that's a great new update. So it, it just shows that the things like reports and the letters and things are, are, are working. Like I'm sensing there might be like a communication issue here because I, for what you're saying that, that everything's up and, and, and yesterday- Well, when did they go up is, is what I would be interested in. Yeah, so things like audited financial statements and budgets and things like that were, have always been up. Um, because of the like recent conversation and because of people talking about meeting minutes not being online, like those have all, also recently gone up. But things like budgets and financial statements and like our bylaws and our policies, the most updated versions of all of those things have always been uh, on the website or uh, have actively been put back on the website. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna put a pin in this one for a second. I wanna ask you, um, uh, start with you, Victoria, on this one. Support for the CFS is quite divided, uh, but the CFS has supported the RSU several times in the past uh, with initiatives like the closing Gold Street, uh, splitting tuition payments, things like that. Furthermore, CFS offers many equity initiatives which uh, alternative groups like uh, the CASA and uh, they can't offer. So if the RSU ever left the CFS, how would the RSU fill that gap in these important equity initiatives? For sure. I mean, that's a discussion that would be had to be had, to be had by a lot more people than, than myself. Um, in terms of um, 
support. We, we have found that we've been able to have a direct access to government um, just on our own as the RSU. Um, our, the VP education last year was able to prove that. Um, so in terms of educational advocacy, I think we're, we're in a very good position. In terms of equity, we do have six equity centers on campus um, that, are, that could definitely use more funding. Um, so I mean, if, if students were open to it um, and perhaps maybe weren't paying like the half a million to the CFS, those could definitely be strengthened. I'll ask you, can the RSU do better elsewhere? Yeah. Um, I kind of want to answer two parts of this question. It's been brought up that uh, the Ryerson Students Union like gives half a million dollars to the Federation. Um, each individual student pays about $16 um, that goes to both the Provincial, uh, the Canadian Federation of Students Ontario, and the Canadian Federation of Students National. It's a combined $16 membership fee, and that's what students pay. Individual students are members of the Federation, not the Ryerson Students Union. Sure. Th that means that if if the if students at Ryerson leave the federation, it does the Ryerson Students Union does not absolve that money into their operating budget. The second part that I really want to touch on, I actually got involved in this in the Canadian Federation of Students. I got involved in equity work on this campus. I know that Ryerson has a, an incredible history of doing equity work. I worked at the Racialized Students Collective. I was the first coordinator uh, of the Racialized Students Collective. Uh, I was the vice president of equity here. I know of a lot of the really important anti-oppression work that happens on this campus. That work only helps to complement and push students' uh, goals further on a provincial and a national level. It's because of the work that we see happening at things like the Center for Women and Trans People with the Sexual Assault Survivor Support Line that has created the basis for us to be able to push for things like Bill 132. I don't think that they need to exist in place of each other, but I think that they both need to exist together. Um, the next question I'll direct to you, Rajan, and I want to talk about unity. Unity, because the CFS is about unity and strength in numbers. But oftentimes when their own members try to leave, the CFS action suggests otherwise. Uh, the bylaws seem to make it extremely difficult for unions to leave, and in the past, over a dozen schools have made pushes to leave, and the CFS has fought them in and outside the courtroom, uh, such as in the case of U of T, uh, UVic, uh, McGill, Guelph and the University of Ottawa, to name a few of them. So if unity is so important to the CFS, why are so many unions trying to leave? Um, I can't speak specifically to like each individual case uh, at each student's union or each uh, university as to why there's been conversations about leaving the Federation. What I can't say is um, that this history uh, of being a litigious organization uh, is one that we've like very successfully moved away from. Uh, really? Resolved, because there seems to be a lot of ongoing or a lot of lawsuits in the past few years. We've resolved every single like outstanding legal case, um, both provincially and nationally. Something that hasn't been reflected in the report, but also something that was given from us uh, in our information uh, for the report. So all of, those uh, all of those legal matters that were outstanding are also taken care of. Right, so I, I want Victoria actually to respond to that. Then I think I want to just talk about my personal experience of, of going to CFS meetings and, and engaging with them. It's certainly a culture where if you express any sort of like counter view, it's, it's not, you risk kind of social repercussions at, at the conference and things like that, from dirty looks to comments to sneers, things like that. Um, like for example, at the last national general meeting, um, we, the, the audience, we had an MP come in um, or, or a government official and uh, for a lobby session and people chanted the MP out of the room, like chanting shame at him and stuff to the point where he left. Um, and I asked, you know, a follow-up question months later, asking like, so what's our relationship with that government official now? Like, I mean, we kind of chased them out of a room. And after asking that question at the meeting, not only were I, was I um, met with dirty looks and stuff, but I was, I was given comments afterwards and things like that. So it's not exactly the organization that uh, students who want to question the tactics and want to question um, the operations really feel safe to do so. And that's definitely an area we want to work on um, together, hopefully. Um, because that's been my experience, or, or when or when we question things about the budget, it's 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 not met with the friendliest tone. Is there a hostile environment at CFS meetings? Um, so the Ryerson Students Union has been one of uh, a handful of students unions that have submitted a letter talking about reforms that they want to see within the organization. I 100% welcome that conversation. I think that that is an important conversation to have. If there's issues, if there's things that our organization can do better, I think that we should we should talk about them. General meetings are an excellent space to be able to talk about these things. Um, if but I, is there a space? Is the space that the CFS is creating allow for people to to you know voice their dissent or voice their concerns with the CFS? Yeah, I like I've been on both sides of the uh, of the conversation. I've both been a delegate. Um, and have seen things happen within the organization that I've been unhappy about or that I wanted to see change. I've been the dissenting voice. I've gone to the microphone and I think that 
I haven't had the same experiences and I, I, I don't want to uh, know that we're at any level cultivating a space that seems unsafe or that feels like people can't share uh, in conversation or people can't participate actively in conversation. We try to take a lot of steps to ensure that there's like a baseline of safety. We have anti-harassment advisors, like people that are there as support workers um, to be able to uh, ensure that people are going through the meeting, they're not feeling like bullied or harassed or targeted uh, in those spaces. And but are those people doing their jobs? Because again, a lot of people seem to seem to feel that way. I mean, the letter that was released yesterday, um, there there's 10 unions that signed it. So I guess the question I want to ask you is, are you concerned about the number of voices that seem to have issues with the CFS? I think that it means that we are uh, gonna have a lot of constructive conversations, mm -hmm. um, that we need to have a lot of con constructive conversations about um, how we address those issues, how we address the issues that people are perceiving within the organization, um, how we work to make those spaces safer spaces for everybody. Um, but uh, again, as a spokesperson for the organization, we welcome criticism. Uh, before I move on, is there anything, would you like to respond at all to what Rajan just said? I mean, in terms of um, saying that like we're no longer a litigation culture and like why it wasn't reflected in the report, I, I, I'm curious as to what evidence there is to suggest that when, I mean, U of T was just resolved like the past month, Kate Breton was thinking about filing bankruptcy not even a year ago. Like, I don't know what timeline we're looking at here in terms of when, when there was a culture shift. Um, and then also speaking of culture shifts, I think, I, I think students feel unsafe um, going even to the anti-harassment officers and things like that because it, it's, it's the culture within the, the organization itself, the organizers, the participants kind of often blend into one in terms of often feeling against those who, who want to speak crit critically. All of the cases that you've mentioned are also things that started before my time in the organization, um, but they're all things that like people that are currently working within the organization have done a lot of work to, to put behind us. La Cité, uh, Francophone University in Ottawa, brought concerns uh, of the organization. While working to meet those concerns, they also uh, like expressed the desire to have a referendum and to leave the organization. They entered a referendum uh, and have left the organization. To be fair though, that's only one example. There seems to be a lot of examples of, of, of unions trying to leave and not being able to, like you mentioned Cape Breton and the ones I mentioned uh, earlier. It, there seems to be more examples of that. Yeah, and I think that actually, like. Also, what we need to talk about is that in a lot of those cases, um, like in Cape Breton specifically, we're talking about a student's union that actively worked to subvert the bylaws uh, of the organization that have been democratically decided on by students across the country and across the province. Were all those unions actively you know, going against the bylaws? I, I don't want to say all of those student unions because I honestly don't have that information for you. but. Uh, a number of the cases in which like we've had to seek legal advice or had to uh, seek a, a third party uh, uh, like intervention like through a judge or through the court system uh, have been cases where people have either had some disagreement with the bylaws of the federation, have had disagreement with uh, the processes or have not followed the processes. Uh, and I think it is important that we uh, strive to, to hold the democratic processes that people have developed uh, across the country, that students have talked about, that students have discussed um, the processes to join or leave an organization and what that looks like. And I think that it's important that we keep to those processes okay. um, and work to uphold those bylaws. May I quickly respond Please. to that? Um, respond and then I'm going to move on to the next question. For sure. I, I, I do just want to mention that it's not just some students that are saying the, the process to leave is too difficult. There have been two, at least two court systems in Canada that have recognized that certain provisions within it are either outdated or um, unnecessarily burdensome or, or um, against the charter, like the, the Canadian rights. Um, are oh, you referring to the Quebec one, I assume? In that. Yeah, Quebec, okay. Quebec right. that U of okay. T said, um, the courts in that scenario right. said that it was outdated. When there are court systems that also say that the bylaws aren't right, that should be a huge red flag. Um, and and either, either way, the fact that there are so many student unions or students that have to engage in litigation, regardless of who starts it, that's a huge amount of student resources that are being wasted on that. Um, and and it, it, having a process to leave just being so difficult that you have to like drain your time and resources to the point where you just can't fight the battle anymore isn't an adequate source of membership retention. And that's what it does feel like at this point. I know this is a big uh, spot of contention, but we're, I'm going to have to leave it for, on this one just for time purposes. But uh, Rachel, I'm going to ask you the next question. Uh, the CFS has been accused of involving itself in student elections uh, by picking favorite candidates and helping uh, CFS-friendly candidates uh, campaign. Uh, 
the CFS has also been criticized, and it was mentioned earlier, uh, about cultivating a hostile uh, environment where some members with opposing views feel that their voices are being drowned out. What I want to ask you is how can union, union members trust that the CFS is putting uh, student needs ahead of its own institutional needs? The Federation doesn't participate in any student union or local elections uh, in like any capacity. We don't work to pick candidates for elections. We don't work to resource elections or do any of that kind of work. Uh, then how do you, I guess, respond to allegations that, for example, uh, some RSU past presidents have campaigned on other campuses for, the, for, the, for those schools, such as U of T in York, for their, for their student elections. You know, at least anecdotally, it says that they've had ties to CFS. Um, and there's been quite a few of those examples. So how would you respond to that? Um, when I started here at Ryerson, I worked for the Racialized Students Collective. Uh, I didn't work for the Canadian Federation of Students, and I didn't work for the Ryerson Students Union. Uh, well, I guess I worked for the Ryerson Students Union through the Racialized Students Collective. I was a student that was interested in anti-racism organizing. Um, that meant that I also got to do a lot of work with students from other campuses. Um, and uh, a lot of those people are also people that are interested in engaging in their students' unions. Uh, in the past, when I, like before getting involved with the Federation, have gone out to support or volunteer, uh, that has always been in a friend capacity. I have a friend at the University of Toronto who's like running in an election and like is calling for volunteers actively on their Facebook. Like, yes, obviously the people that are interested in that organizing or interested in talking about these issues meet each other or know each other and do that work. Um, has that work ever been facilitated through the Canadian Federation of Students? No. So, Victoria, I'd like you to respond to, to that, please. Um, we very carefully said in the report that um, it's key individuals that are very heavily connected to the CFS, not necessarily the CFS itself. I have no doubt that the Canadian Federation is not sending a top-down order mm -hmm. for this to happen. Um, that said, I mean, we've just heard the CFS's response, but I can, I can deliver you candidates who have run in elections on campuses who feel and can confirm themselves from personal lived experience without a shadow of a doubt that the CFS or, sorry, key CFS individuals have been involved in those elections. To speak further, I know that this is a topic that there has been other individuals who were threatened with a defamation suit on, on trying to push this topic, so it's not one that I spent a lot of time on in the report, um, but it's definitely uh, one that those who have run in the student elections feel without a shadow of doubt is true. So, I mean, we're talking about um, putting student needs ahead of institutional needs. So, Victoria, I just want to know, from the RSU standpoint, what needs to be done to get this relationship between the RSU and the CFS back on track? Start, start with the conversations. I mean, that's where they, they always start, but also start with um, making sure, sure those conversations are, have some way of being passed forward to the next year. I mean, it's certainly... Um, Students are at a disadvantage because often we have one-year terms, and so it's very difficult to maintain um, or add on to discussions year after year um, with the CFS. The complaints that we're having now were happening 30 years ago. Um, so it's very discouraging for us to feel like we should just keep talking about things when it hasn't changed in 30 years. All right, so now I guess it's time. Um, I'll give each of you a chance to deliver just some closing statements. Yeah. Um, I think that this conversation that we're having about the value of the Canadian Federation of Students or uh, a better organization, what we, need to, what we need to be doing moving forward is talking about how we're collectively using our resources and, and collecting, collectively using our people power um, to, to push decision makers to make students' lives better, to, to alleviate those issues, to be on campus, to talk to students about the day-to-day -day struggles that they're going through. Um, and there are plenty of opportunities to be able to do that and I think that this conversation that we're having about the Federation is underpinned with a, a willingness to do that work and, and to come away representing our members and to come away representing student issues. All right, thank you. And Victoria, your closing statement, please. As we've talked about today, we know that this year is a very crucial year for tuition fees with that new tuition framework. Uh, but if you look at the history of the CFS and the campaign that we're running, the Fight the Fees campaign compared to previous campaigns before it, it's, it's so strikingly similar. And I just, I can't in good faith um, put, put our resources into this campaign um, or the work that's currently be do being done when it hasn't proved itself successful in 30 years. And for that reason, I need to circle back to what I've been saying since the beginning, which is it's not does the CFS provide any value whatsoever, it's does the CFS provide enough value considering what we contribute and can that value be better elsewhere. Um, and that's, that's a discussion that I really, really need to have with students this year um, because I think the answer is ir inarguably, yes, there is better value to be had. Victoria Morton, RSU VP Education, Rajan Hoylet. 
spokesperson for the CFS. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us today.